You are welcome to the teaching ministry of Reverend Dr. Femi Olale or IKEA Christian Center Global. Get set to be edified. The word works. So last week, we began to say, and we started by saying that man is a spirit, he has a soul, lives in a body. But we were uh, very particular, particular in mentioning that mm -hmm. man a spirit is not man. Are you seeing that? You cannot have and say that man is spirit alone. Now, when we say man is a spirit, we are, and we try to emphasize the spirit aspect of man, we are doing that for a purpose. There is a context in which we say man is a spirit that has a soul and lives in the body. And that context is in terms of the part of man that should be exercised, the part of man that should have dominion, which is the spirit of man. But man is not just a spirit. Man, all right, is also a soul and is also, all right, a body. And the reason why I'm making that um, um, emphasis tonight, like I did last time, is to ensure that we understand that a man is a legal entity. Okay? Man is a legal entity, all right? For a man to operate on the earth, for a being to operate on the earth, he has to have flesh and bones. Because the heaven, the heavens belongs to God, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So men, all right, for a being to be called a man and for a being to have legal right to operate on the earth, he must have a physical side to him, all right, to himself. Hallelujah. He must have a physical side to himself. The Bible says in Luke 18, it says, men ought always to pray. Angels do not pray. It is men that ought always to pray. And why is it that men ought always to pray? Because men, all right, are the ones that have the authority on the earth, not spirits, men. All right? Men. So men are the ones that have the authority to engage God, all right, concerning affairs and things going on on the earth men glory to god men okay that's a very very important thing to understand the, you, the earth god created and gave custody of the earth to man hallelujah so we find that there were things god did not create all right that came into being by the activities of the man God created. So, for example, the Bible lets us know that it was all right by one man, sin came into the world. Sin entered into the world. Romans 5:12. All right, by one man. Then it now goes on to say, and death by sin. So we see clearly that neither sin nor death was created by God. So sin and death are the offshoots of the activities of man. Seeing death, the activities of man, not God. Because man is the one that has the authority on the earth. So what men permit on the earth, what men permit to be expressed, that's what's going to be expressed on the earth. Glory to God. So when we see Jesus coming on the scene, Jesus does not permit hatred to be expressed through him. Jesus does not permit Envy to be expressed through him. Jesus does not permit murder to be expressed through him or by anyone close to him. Remember when he was being arrested, all right, at the garden, um, Peter comes with a knife and cuts off the ear of Marcus. Jesus rebukes Peter. Are you, do you understand? He said, no, 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 no. No damage. That's not me. That's not my character. That's not who I am. All right? This is not what God planned for man to do on the earth. Man's plan on the earth was not to bring death and shedding of blood. And on my account shall no blood be said. He takes off the ear of Marcus and heals it. Are you seeing that? All right? All right? Now, it was by one man, the ear came off. But by another man, the ear did what? Get what, what was what slapped right uh, back, back, back in, showing you that what is seen on the earth is actually due to the permission or the resistance of men. Praise the Lord. Ah, this thing we've just said here this thing, what you see manifested on the earth 
is based on the permission or the resistance of men. We already know God is good. What does God want on the earth? Every single thing that has to do with God. We see Jesus. Jesus is 100% the will of God manifested. What does God want? As regards he, um, the sick, he wants them healed. What does God want? As regards the blind, he wants them to see. Amen. Now, you know many a times when we see Jesus healing the blind in the Gospels, all right, many a times we need to also see the spiritual um, implication of that. In, that. in that Jesus goes around healing the blind physically, he shows us that it is only God that can open the eyes of the blind spiritually. So Jesus did not just come to open the eyes of the blind physically. He also came to open the blind eyes of the blind world spiritually. Now, when the eyes of the blind, the blind who is blind spiritually is open, we say that that man has received what? Salvation. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4? He said, if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them, all right, who are lost, to whom the God of this world has done what? Blinded their what? They are hearts. Are you seeing that? So there is also a blinding of the heart that is um, um, healed, all right, when a man receives the gospel and turns, all right, to the Lord. So it was important for us to establish that, that man is a spirit, soul, and, and body. And um, when we establish that, we now need to now look, we went on to look at that it is the soul aspect, the soulish aspect of man, or the mind of man, or uh, in that sense, where spiritual growth happens. You understand? Because growth is in knowledge. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, today we're going to go ahead to explain the kind of knowledge that causes, um, the kind of knowledge we're supposed to grow in that we result into spiritual development, all right, and proper spiritual growth. You can have head knowledge and not grow. You can have head knowledge and not have fruit. There are a lot of theologians who don't believe in Jesus, but they have head knowledge concerning the scriptures. They can quote it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are the definition of having head knowledge concerning the scriptures. They could quote it, but they did not understand what he was talking about. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. the Father of glory, may give, may give unto, unto you. you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now he said, he give unto you the spirit of what? Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. All right, go on. It says the eyes. The eyes of your understanding being, being enlightened. enlightened yes. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Yes. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Yes. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to now, us. Now, 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 the word when he says that, um, it may, let me give it to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That word revelation is apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means to unveil that which was hidden. Okay. All right. It means to unveil that which was hidden. Now, that keeps in, in tow with that concept of the mystery is made manifest. Am I going remember that? All right, in Colossians chapter 1, where it says that the mystery that was kept from the foundation of the which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul is still towing the same line when he's saying revelation in the knowledge of him, apocalypsis. So that means if you are talking about, um, if apocalypsis means to unveil that which is hidden, and he says what is being unveiled, is the knowledge of Christ. It means that Christ is that mystery that was hidden, all right, that needs to now be what? Unveiled to the people Paul is referring to. Are you, are you with me so far? Uh -huh. So it now goes that word. The, 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 you see the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you know of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that he may what? That he may know what? The hope, hope of his calling. The hope of his calling. That is why he has called you. Now, the calling of God in Christ was before time began. Remember that. Uh -huh. So, the hope of his calling. And what is the what? Riches of the inheritance in the what? Now, what is the riches of the inheritance in the saints? That is Christ in you. All right? The spirit within. All right? The riches of his inheritance in faith. And he said, and the exceeding greatness of his power at work in us what? Who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, 
Paul is talking about, number one, that you may know, all right, that your eyes may be, um, that, um, that the, no, no, no. He says that you may, um, the spirit of wisdom revelation. So, revelation, the apocalypse is, is saying that Christ will be unveiled to you, number one. And the unveiling of Christ to you is going to happen by what? The enlightenment of your understanding. When he says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, eyes there is talking about your mind, your ability to understand. So it's talking about your understanding. Okay? In Ephesians, it talks about the understanding of the uh, of sinners, their understanding having been darkened. Okay? So the eyes of your understanding is talking about understanding. So the eyes of understanding, eyes of enlightenment. Okay? So he's saying the veil taken away. Christ is unveiled to you. I am praying that Christ is unveiled to you. And the result of that is that you have clear understanding, enlightened understanding, understanding without shadows. All right? You have clarity of understanding. Praise God. All right? Concerning the person of Christ. Then the next thing he moves. He now says, all right, that you may know, all right, the riches of his glory in the saints. So, as a result of your understanding of Christ and what he has done for you, you now move to understanding, all right, the riches of the inheritance inside you, in you. He proceeds to talk about the exceeding greatness of his power at work, all right, towards you. So, there are three things Paul wants the believer to know. Number one, he wants Christ to be unveiled to him. Where he has clarity concerning who Christ is. Number two, he wants this man, all right, who is in Christ, to understand the riches of the inheritance that is in him because he's in Christ. And number three, for this man to understand the exceeding greatness. Hallelujah exceeding greatness of the power at work. Now, that word or that verse of scripture where you have exceeding greatness, exceeding greatness of his power at work, all right, what does it say next after that? Which he wrought in Christ. Which he wrought in Christ. Uh -huh. When he raised him from the dead. When he raised him from the dead. No, no, read it again. It, it's the more Greek words there. All right, start from that you may know the exceeding greatness. Uh-huh. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who do believe? Uh -huh. According to the working of his mighty Stop. power. Stop. I said, according to the working of his what? Mighty power. So, you see that word exceeding? The word exceeding is from the Greek word upa balo. What does upa balo mean? Upa balo means beyond target. Upa is a superlative. All right? Like hyper. So, when he says upa balo, he's saying, all right, he's saying, look, the power okay, is more than enough, okay, all right, it's not just enough, it exceeds the requirements, so it says the exceeding greatness of his power, after Upabalo, the word there is exceeding, exceeding is megetos, that is where we get mega from, or magnitude, you understand, so what Paul is trying to describe to us, all right, in Ephesians chapter 1, he's trying to show us how supreme the power is at work for us in Christ. He says, the exceeding greatness of his power, all right, which in wrought in Christ, according to his mighty power. So everywhere in Ephesians 1, 17, you have power, 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 power. God is saying, or Paul is saying, that the power at work in the believer, glory to God, exceeds any demonstration of power the world has ever seen. And that the only demonstration that equates to the power at work in the believer is the one that was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And even in that resurrection, it was excess power. God demonstrated more power, glory to God, in raising Jesus from the dead than needed to be demonstrated. Are you following? That's what he's saying. And he said, I am praying that you know. So the prayer of Ephesians chapter 1, 17 is a prayer for the saints to know. Are you following? Uh -huh. For the saints to know. 
Because if the saints don't know, then they will walk in darkness. They will walk in ignorance of what has been made available to them. Glory to God. So it says, the exceeding greatness of his power at work. Hallelujah. All right. According to the working of his mighty strength, which he demonstrated when he raised Jesus from the dead. Say this with me. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in me. Is is at work in me. So it shows us the importance of knowledge. Now, there's something very powerful here in that Paul prays that they know. I've always thought about that. <laughs> I've always thought about that. Paul prays. Because I'm thinking, if it's about knowledge, I should just teach you. And you should know. But Paul prays for a church he teaches. Because you see, the Ephesian church, all right, was a church that grew a lot as a result of Paul's ministry in Acts of Apostles chapter 19. We find that he found 12 guys at Ephesus that he got filled with the Spirit. And they were speaking in tongues. It's in Ephesus that the Bible declares, and so mightily grew the word of God, all right, and prevailed. It was in Ephesus, Ephesus that we heard that the word of God grew so much that people gave up their magic art, gave up their magic book, and they submitted it to be burned. That Ephesus. Yet, Paul comes out to say to them, I'm praying for you that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may what? No, which means that spiritual enlightenment, glory to God, has a divine component in it. Glory to God. Spiritual enlightenment has a divine component with it. There is the opening of eyes that comes from God, that is by the Spirit of God. So, in as much as we read the scriptures, in as much as we teach it, it takes the spirit of God, hallelujah, glory to God, to open our eyes to the depths of the scripture. We can study it, we can read it, but enlightenment, where light breaks forth, is impossible without the spirit. Hallelujah. It's impossible without the Spirit. Now notice, the Spirit of God will enlighten us to see what is in the Scripture. The Spirit of God will not bring another revelation that is not in the book. Because this is the essence of Paul praying. Paul is not praying that they should get another revelation different from what is in Scripture. No, Paul is praying that they may know what is in there. Hallelujah. But the reason why he's praying for them to know what is in there is because at first glance, you don't necessarily see Jesus without the Spirit. Glory to God. I said glory to God. All right, for example, think about it for a moment. All right. How exactly do you see Jesus in the brazen serpent? Are you following what I'm saying? If you don't read the Gospels, where Jesus himself says, as Moses lifted up the serpent. How exactly are you going to know that the brazen serpent in the book of Numbers is talking about Jesus? Praise the Lord. How will you know that the manna, okay, all right, was a parable, all right, that Jesus was going to use to refer to himself being the bread of life if Jesus himself doesn't use that example? You understand? So Jesus, okay, is the essence of scriptures. It is Jesus that helps us understand, all right, the mystery in the Old Testament. Because without Jesus, the Old Testament remains a mystery. Hallelujah. How do we see Jesus in the story of Jonah without Jesus coming on the scene and telling us that as Jonah stayed in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. It's Jesus that lets us see that. Glory to God. So Paul is praying. I'm praying for you to really understand that the book is about him. That the mystery is unveiled in Jesus. That's his prayer. 
and that for you to understand the riches of his glory, inheritance in you because you've believed in him and the power that is at work for you because you've believed in him. And for you to understand that the magnitude of that power, all right, is essentially the same, all right, as that that was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from there. Now, notice something very powerful. Paul uses the resurrection of Jesus to speak about the greatest demonstration of the power of God. Resurrection of Jesus. He does not use creation. Which means, <laughs> glory to God, the power demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead supersedes the power demonstrated in creation. Why? It's simple. Because in the resurrection, by, 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 um, I mean resurrection, Jesus was able to take humanity from darkness into light. Hallelujah. He defeated death. Glory to God. By his resurrection. He defeated sickness by his resurrection. He defeated mortality by his resurrection. And he brought immortality into life. He didn't come out by himself. He came out with humanity. Well, yes, uh, humanity must receive what Jesus has offered for him to be a recipient. Man must receive. Glory to God. I said glory to God. All right, man must receive. Man must believe and receive what God has offered in Christ. But Jesus came out with all of humanity. He did what he did for all humanity. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. At the resurrection of the dead. That's it. And it's that same power that is keeping Jesus alive today. It's that same resurrection power, glory to God, that gives us eternal life. Hallelujah. It's that work of redemption that ensures, glory to God, all right, all right, ensures that we have a high priest representing us right now. Glory to God. It's that work of resurrection that guarantees our salvation. Praise God. Because he ever lived to make what? Representation for us. Paul is praying. I pray you understand it. Because if you understand it, your life will never remain the same. Understanding what Jesus has done is the difference between living for yourself and living for God. Understanding what Jesus has done is the difference between Trying to use God to get your needs met and finding out what God's will is and doing everything that you can to ensure that his will is carried out. Understanding. Hallelujah. I said understanding. Glory to God. So you cannot grow without understanding. Amen. You cannot grow without understanding. You can't grow without it. And you see, God desires for us to grow. Why? Because the more you grow, the more responsibilities can be handed to you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Amen. He said, as newborn babes. Is that correct? Desire the word. Sincere milk of the word. Now, you know what that word babes is? The word babes. Now, by the way, babes there don't mean a fine girl. That's not what it means. I remember there was a time I, was, I, I put up something. I was teaching about spiritual babes and, uh, and, uh, and all. And someone thought I was talking about girls, women. You understand? So, <laughs> I was saying something. And someone was, I, I was really taken aback. I was like, sorry, what do you mean? They said, you said spiritual babes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I said spiritual babes. He said, now, why are, we, why are you generalizing like that? Not all spiritual babes are like that. I said, oh, you mean I'm talking about women? No. <laughs> so let me clarify. Amen. It's like saying, the, my old man. And someone says, why are you talking about your dad like that? No, no. It's, it's the Bible. The old man has been crucified with him. Not my, 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 <laughs> not my dad. Praise the Lord. Now, look at verse 22. It says, as, uh, it says, as newborn babes. Is that correct? Is that what it said? It says, desire the what? Sincere milk of the word. That, that you may, may what? Grow, that you may grow thereby. Now, you see that word there, babes, is the Greek word brephos. B-R-E-P-H-O-S. 
breakfast. It means an infant, like a, like my, my, my baby Sophia right now is a breakfast, right? As an infant, all right? It's the same word that is used. So the word breakfast is used for an infant or the baby in the womb of the mother. So, for example, where the Bible says in the book of Luke, Luke uh, where it says, and um, um, the baby leaped in the womb of Elizabeth, all right? That word for baby there is brephos. So, brephos is talking to, uh, referring to the baby in the womb or a baby that is just born, all right, that is still developing, all right? That's what brephos is. So, when he says, as newborn babes, he is referring to the spiritual state of his audience. So, Paul is saying, that as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may what? Grow thereby. Now, if he says the sincere milk, when he's talking about there, it's sound doctrine. Because if he qualifies the milk as sincere, it means that there is a milk that is not what? Sincere. He should have just said that as newborn babes desire the milk of the word. No, but he says desire the sincere milk of the world. So, what does that tell us? It tells us that there is a message that can cause people to grow. Are you saying, are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, there is a message, the right kind of message, that can cause people to grow. Glory to God. You know, when we talk about signs of spiritual growth, signs of spiritual growth, we will have to draw it all right, from being more like Christ in your attitude and your conduct. Amen. Amen. What well, number one sign of spiritual growth is that you lose the need to retaliate. Because the Bible says about Jesus, for when he was reviled, he did what? He reviled not again. So that need and desire for vengeance, to revenge, dies. That's spiritual growth. You are looking more like Jesus. Spiritual growth means to look more like him. Amen. Where your soul is reflecting and manifesting the character of the new man that you currently are in your spirit. That's spiritual growth. You are more and more like Jesus, expressing Jesus more and more in your conduct. Glory to Jesus. I said glory to Jesus. One by second, a sign of spiritual growth, I'm digressing, is that your number one desire is to do God's will. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes there and cries, not my will, but your will. Now, isn't it interesting that we have the incarnate son, God in human flesh. Yes, he was a man. There was a part of him that didn't want to do the will of God. That is Jesus. Glory to God. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. So, one of the signs of spiritual growth is that you are able to, all right, you prioritize God's will above yours, that's what, no, 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 um, uh, one. And the second thing about it is that you are able to cause your body and your soul to submit to God's will. You are not said to be growing spiritually if you are still a slave of your fleshly desires. One way we know you are growing is mastery over the desires of your body. So, spiritual growth is seen in choices. Choices. The choices that you make. Hallelujah. The choices that you make. Glory to God. Fourth place we are going to see spiritual growth is in your speech. Your speech, how you talk. Bible lets us know that the Pharisees, Sadducees, always came to Jesus to tempt him in his words. Yet, in his words, they couldn't catch him. Hallelujah. So one way we are able to see your growth spiritually is in your words. 
in that you are able to pass a message, glory to God, without, how will I put this? You are able to pass a message without leaving any emblem or sign that you have seen in, the, in your trying to pass it. I'll give you an example. The Pharisees and Sadducees wanted to what? They wanted to trap Jesus. So they sent Jesus, and they sent some guys to Jesus and said, should we pay taxes? Are you paying attention? He said, should we pay taxes? Then, look at how Jesus responded. Now, if Jesus said, don't pay taxes, what is he doing? That means he's instigating an insurrection against the Roman government. If Jesus says, pay taxes, they will say, you are not a true Israelite because you should know that we are colonized by the Roman government. You should you, you understand. So, you know, they put him in the in a, in a mix. They were trying to trap him. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, give me a coin. He comes. He says, whose description is on it? He says, it's Caesar. He said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are what are God's. Are you seeing that? They couldn't catch him in his words. So there was a level of wisdom he had. Now, let me tell you something. When you are, as a believer, at that stage where you are always saying your mind, you are not growing spiritually. Jesus never always said his mind. Because if he said his mind, they would have killed him before time. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? You understand? If you have an understanding of your purpose in God, you will understand that there are some battles you don't fight when it's not time. And because there are battles you don't fight when it's not time, you ensure you don't attract those battles until it's time. Mastery over your speech. Hallelujah. Now, the truth about it is this. We will know where you are in your speech. You cannot hide it. We will know. Glory to God. We will know. Now, I know some people have taught mastery, um, um, spiritual good in terms of speaking, um, speaking from the standpoint of, oh, I don't say I'm poor. I don't say I'm sick. You know those kind of stuff. <laughs> Amen. I true about it, but sorry, scriptures. There's no exact place where we have those kind of examples because, I mean, Apostle Paul said, Trophimus, have I left in Miletus sick? Paul called, said the guy was sick. Then he tells us about Epaphroditus. He says Epaphroditus was sick and now he was dying. Praise God. So for a believer to say, I, I, I'm sick, it's not anti faith. Are, are you following what I'm saying? Come on, are you following what I'm saying? It's not anti faith. It's not. <laughs> Amen. You can say, I refuse to be sick. The power of God is going through my body. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, people say, say, say when you say, ah, um, you are sick. No, you, are, you cannot be sick. Ah. Eh. Where do we see it in scripture? It says, they that dwell daring shall not say, I am what? What is the context? Zion is a spiritual, you know, is a spiritual principle. He's talking about the church. What's the church? The church is the, you know, the redeemed ones. So if we are talking about Zion, we're talking about redemption, the work of Christ. All right. Uh, what Jesus did in, in his death, burial, and resurrection. What did Jesus do by his death, burial, and resurrection? He brought redemption for us and forgave our sins. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, and if you study in scripture, you're going to find that um, man's lost state is usually akin to being spiritually what? Sick. That's why in First Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four. Let's turn in there real quickly. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four. Let's have Pastor Jennifer read it. Who is on self bear our sins in his own body? What did he bear tree? on his body? Our sins. Continue. That we being dead to sins, yes, shall yes. live unto righteousness. Yes. By whose stripes we were healed. Notice he is saying he says by whose stripes we were healed, but he's talking about sin. So the healing is not bodily healing in 1 Peter 2.24. All right? The healing we refer to is what? Is salvation. Which means the sinner man, he's sick. 
That condition of being lost and dead in sin is a sickness. And the person who brought the cure is Jesus. Salvation is the cure for the spiritual malady called sinna. Are you following what I'm saying here? Is there body healing, healing in Christ? Oh yeah. Of course there is. Through the name of Jesus. By the power of the Spirit of God at work in us. Yes. Glory to God. All right. And we see examples of that. Even before Jesus Christ went to the cross, he healed many sick people. The apostles healed many sick people also. Glory to God. Elisha healed the sick. Elijah healed the sick. All right. Amen. All right. We had several examples of people who healed the sick. The only example we have of folk. In fact, um, did Abraham heal the sick? Did Abraham heal the sick? Ah, you're thinking. Okay, do you remember that time when somebody took Abraham's wife? And um, nobody, everyone was barren for the period Abraham's wife was in that king's house. Things are All right. Then uh, God tells Abimelech, you're a dead man. Okay. Then he says, go to Abraham and he'll pray for you. All right. And after Abraham prayed for him, everybody was fine. Are you seeing that? So that's because barrenness is a sickness. Okay. And they were healed after Abraham prayed. Are you, you understand what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. So healing, all right, is consistent with the character of God. Okay. And people were healed prior, all right, to Jesus, all right, coming, okay, all right, what people did not have prior to Jesus coming was that they couldn't be born again, okay, they couldn't be born again, they couldn't um, um, have the life of God in them, Christ in you was not a possibility to them, that's what Jesus came to bring, to take away the sickness of sin and to bring about healing hallelujah i said hallelujah all right praise god so very very importantly what helps the believer grow is knowledge now i want to explain the kind of knowledge i'm talking about we find this kind of knowledge mentioned several in scripture is the word epignosis hmm. Epignosis is important. What does epignosis mean? Epignosis basically means precise knowledge, accurate knowledge. And the reason why Paul uses this word epignosis is because he was surrounded by a lot of people who had some knowledge, but it was not accurate. They could quote Moses correctly. But they did not have an understanding of what Moses was saying. Amen. All right. So it was not called, it was not accurate. Epignosis is accurate, full knowledge. Accurate knowledge and full knowledge. Precise understanding. A knowledge without uh, shadows, so to speak. Hallelujah. How many of you, guys, how many of you have had a subject? You, initially, you, di you, you didn't understand it fully. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. But you knew enough to pass. And, and you understand what I'm saying? You knew enough to pass, but you didn't understand it fully. So, you know, in our Nigerian education system, I always tell someone, I said, look, our education system is this way. It is a test of how well you can climb. So when somebody has a first class in Nigeria, what it means is this. He has a first class climbing skill. Because if you take that guy and ask him conceptual questions based on, so for example, you, say, you want to test whether he understands the basic principles concerning, you know, the subject, you're going to find out that he doesn't understand it. Praise the Lord. You understand? I I'll give you an example. Okay, you have Doc over there. You have medicine, right? Huh? Okay, dentistry. Okay. Now, okay, let me use a med medical stuff. 
we are told there's something called Mark Bonnie's points in medicine. You understand? Now, we read it in anatomy. Oh, it's somewhere here, you know. But then when you are in anatomy, you crammed the procession of uh, when you open the top, this part. When you open it, this is what you're going to see under. When you open it, this is what you're going to see under. There's open, you understand what I'm talking about? Now, you can cram it. Are you following? Then when you get into the exam, they ask you, all right, describe the anterior abdominal wall moving anteriorly to posteriorly or posteriorly to anteriorly. And you now begin to describe it because you crammed it. Mm, fantastic. You get your A. A, B? Good. All right, they now tell you, okay, let's come and do a surgery. But now we got a problem. You do not know how the abdominal nerves look like. Are you following what I'm saying? You, you say, oh, this is the McBurney's point. Where is it? Uh, you understand? So you have a form of knowledge, but you don't have enough light about the subject matter. As a result, you can't apply it. Are you following what I'm saying? You can't apply it. So see what Peter says. Second Peter chapter 3. Now, this word epignosis appears 20 times. How many times like it appears? 20 times. Mm. Glory to God. In the New Testament. And it was only used by two writers. I remember the time I was studying the word. I found out that epignosis was not, during the time of Paul, it was not a popular word. And it seems as though it was a word coined by Paul because epignosis is made up of two Greek words. A prefix superlative, which is epi, and gnosis. So gnosis was the common word. Gnosis is Greek for knowledge. Okay? Knowledge. But Paul calls, comes and calls it epignosis or epignosco. Okay? Because um, with, uh, it's either you call it epignosis or epignosco. All right? Because gnosco is initial revelation knowledge. All right? So, for example, when you come and say, oh, Jesus is Lord, that is gnosco. It is a knowledge you have as a result of revelation which means by the head of the spirit of god you got to know jesus is lord are you following however for you to now explain in detail that jesus is lord from all scriptures are you following that understanding the intent and purpose of god prophetically behind each one that's a pignosco. So that's why Paul calls his writings the epignosis of the Son. Paul says that the work of the ministry gift is to bring you toward the epignosis of the Son. So the ministry gift's job is not to bring you to knowledge of the Son. Thus, with regular knowledge, Jesus is Lord. Mm -mm. The, the, the ministry gift is to bring you to a full, precise, and accurate knowledge of the Son. The proof that a, a, a saint or a believer is under a ministry gift is that the saints listening to that ministry gift and under the training of that ministry gift will come into a precision and accuracy concerning the, their knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. All right, let's look at First Peter. Hallelujah. Sorry, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 to 3. What does this let's, let's read quickly. Second Peter 1, um, 1 to 3. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, yes. to them that have obtained like precious faith with yeah. us through yes. the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Yes. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Hold on. It says what? Grace and peace. It says what? Grace and peace. It says what? 
Grace and peace. Now, grace, where did we receive grace? Salvation, isn't it? Isn't it? All right. Where did we receive peace? Salvation, isn't it? Isn't it? He said, being justified by faith, Romans 5, 1, we have what? Peace. That word peace there is Irene. Irene means, all right, um, no conflict, no altercation, completeness, wholeness. Irene is the uh, Greek equivalent of the Hebrew shalom. Shalom. So it is used to describe the wholesome, um, the, uh, uh, how do I put it? It's used to describe the wholesome or unhindered access we have with God in Christ. So that's what is called peace. That means there is no animosity between us and God. Now, I want to ask you a question. Between God and man, where is the animosity? Or where was the animosity? Was it with God? Or was it with men? Was it God or with men? Was it men, right? God was not our, God didn't position himself as our enemy. Is that correct? Because it says, for God so loved the world. So it was God who loved the world. The world is the one that didn't love God. Correct? Uh -huh. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave. So it, because he loved us, he gave his only begotten son. Romans 5, 8, he says, while we were yet what sinners, Christ did what? Die. So that means the, the animosity was with us. Glory to God. It was with us. So when he says, grace and peace be multiplied, he's saying the benefits of salvation, that which Christ all right, has done, be magnified. The influence, when he says be multiplied, he's talking about the influence increasing. And how is that influence going to increase? It is through what? Through what? Through what? Huh. So that means the more you know about what Christ has done, the more the influence of the grace he brought and the peace he brought in his justification by faith grows in your life. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the epignosis of what? The knowledge of what? Of the Son, all right? The knowledge of the Son. So it is in the knowledge, accurate, precise understanding of the Son that grace and peace is multiplied. Are you, are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Now, you, do you, you know that knowing the Son is knowing who you are. Because the man in Christ is identified in the Son. Glory. 1 John 4, 17. Where we, can we read it? 1 John 4, 17. All right. Part B says, as he is, so are we in the world. What does part A say? Hearing is our love made perfect. Hearing is our love made perfect. Uh -huh. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That we may have boldness. Hold on. You know, the peace we have with God is actually what gives us boldness. Let us come boldly to what? The throne of what? Of grace. So that boldness to approach is because of the peace the blood of Christ has made available between us and God. Now, you know when Paul was talking about let us come boldly to the throne of grace. You know what the throne of grace was, right? The throne of grace is a mercy seat. Because he was speaking with the items in the uh, tabernacle of Moses in mind. It's a mercy seat. So the throne of grace is a mercy seat. You know, they approach the throne of grace in the Old Testament with fear. And they approach once with blood. But now, by the sacrifice of Jesus, we approach what? Boldly for salvation. So when he says, let us come boldly to a throne of grace, all right, all right, that we might find what? Find what? Grace and what? Help in what? In the time of what? Of need. What help do we need? What mercy are we looking for? It's salvation. Praise God. So we come boldly to that throne of grace once. Just as the high priest in the Old Testament approached the thing once 
a year. And Jesus Christ offered the sacrifice once and for all. We approach that throne once. After we approach once, guess what happens? We begin to sit in Christ on the seat. So we don't come more than once. When we come, hallelujah, and accept his offering, glory to God, we become identified with Christ and we sit with Christ on that seat. You, you understand? Do you understand that? Uh -huh. So we don't come, you know, some people think that, oh, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And I'm talking about coming to the throne of grace repeatedly. The context of coming to the throne of grace is salvation. So we come once. Hallelujah. We come once. So after we come once, we find mercy. We sign grace to help in our time of need. Glory to God. That time there is Kairos. Remember that when God talks about that you call on to me in the time accepted. All right. When is the time accepted? He says today. Today is the day of salvation. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Glory to God. So the dispensation of that is now we call upon the name of the Lord, we come body to the throne of grace, and we find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. What is our time of need? What do we need? We need salvation from what? From sin. And we have that when we approach the throne of grace. Hallelujah. Okay, let us continue. So we've seen 2 Peter 1 and 3. Let's look at 2 Peter 1 and 8. 2 Peter 1 and 8, what does it say? For if these things be in you mm -hmm. and abound, mm -hmm. they, make you, they make you that ye shall be, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Now, Jesus I want Christ. to show you something as a digression. Now, we read 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. I want us to read from verse 4 to 8. Now, pay attention. Now, remember our focus here is spiritual growth. And spiritual growth is measured in your actions. Spiritual growth is measured in your conduct. Spiritual growth is measured in your speech. Spiritual growth can be seen. When someone tells you, oh, I know I'm growing. I'm growing. I heard people say that. Oh, I've grown so much. My question, how do you know? How do you know? I want to ask a question. Truth is this. Who is, who tells that you are growing? You or the people around you? Who are a safe bet? The people around you, is that correct? <laughs> Amen. Now let's get up to the first Peter chapter. Second Peter chapter number one, from verse three to eight. Uh, Pastor Jenny. According By the way, everybody, I will look at your notes. Dami, this one, you are looking at me. I need your notes. Fisaya, your notes. Wale, you are walking around. You give me your notes. Anna, everybody, I'm getting your notes. So maybe you better have a tape recorder in your brain, all right? Because uh, <laughs> you are going to give me those notes. All right, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. What does he say? According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, yes. through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue, mm -hmm. whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, mm -hmm. that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature, mm -hmm. having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm -hmm. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Hold on. You know, the first thing he tells us is what Jesus did. You understand? Yes, sir. You, you know, uh, according as is what grace has given unto us. Notice, has given unto us. So he gave unto us the things that pertain to what? Life and godliness. What's, what life and godliness? Life there is Zoe. Godliness was a beer. So he's talking about life, all right, relationship with God eternally, and what? Godlikeness. So we have the nature of God, all right? He supplied that nature, all right? Uh, when, when, we, when we came to Christ. The next one, he now says, all right, giving all what? Diligence. Yes. He now says, add to what? Your faith, virtue. Add to your what? Your faith, faith what? Virtue. virtue. Who is to add to it? You. you. Next one, after he says virtue, what do you say? If you add again? And to virtue, knowledge. Now that knowledge there is gnosis, not epignosis. All right? He says, add virtue. 
add knowledge. All right. Now, gnosis there is not gnosis of scriptures because it doesn't say scriptures there. It says gnosis. Gnosis is not a Bible word. Gnosis is, gnosis is knowledge. So when he's talking about epignosis of the sun, you know he will tell us epignosis of the sun. Are you seeing that? So it is epignosis of the sun. So he's telling you, you are saved, but be knowledgeable. That's it. He said, add to your faith virtue. That is moral character. Your character. Add it. Let it he's talking about what Paul Peter is talking about here is uh, he's talking about character, things that you should manifest for others to see. For others to see. So virtue, there is godly, moral character. Be a tongue talker, but you are unfair in your dealings with people. Don't be a tongue talker, but you are promoting a Ponzi scheme. Okay? You are promoting a Ponzi scheme. Uh, 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 bring 10,000, you give, we call it for 50,000 in five days. And then bring 100,000, it's 600,000. You know the thing is going to crash. Hallelujah. And then come to ask you, you're up a shoko. No. When you don't have godly character, moral character, it's going to affect your knowledge of Christ. It will affect the communication of the knowledge. Because you say, people will say, if this Jesus could not affect you to uh, make you a fair dealer, how is it going to affect me? It's like a lady, a Christian sister, who is fornicating with her boyfriend, talking to the boyfriend about coming to church. You know, it's confusing. It's a bit confusing. I mean, she, the boyfriend is confused. I mean, here we are, fornicating. You're living in the house with me. We're not married. I've not met your father and mother. And you're saying that Jesus changed your life. <laughs> ah, well, see, you say, but pastor, I'm saying, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus changed your life. I agree, you're saying, but you see, your boyfriend doesn't know it. He's blind. And you have not demonstrated it in your character. I'll tell you what, though, if you break up with him and say, you see, Jesus has changed my life. I do not want to live in sin anymore. All right? And though I love you, this is one of the most difficult things I have to do. I have to walk away from you. All right? Because I want to live a life of consecration, a life to God. Oh, you will get his attention. And he will know for sure that there is a Jesus that encounters men and he causes them to change. It is from your life, he will know. And by that, you will be fruitful in your epignosis for Christ. Add to your faith, virtue. Everybody say, add to my, your faith. Add to your faith. Virtue. It's moral character. Next verse. What does it say? And to knowledge, temperance. Ah, to your faith, virtue. And to your virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. Don't be a man of faith that is an ignoramus. How many of you noticed something about Paul? Guys, how many of you noticed that Paul was very versed? Very versed. Very versed. The Bible lets us know that Paul, he gets to a city, forgotten whether it's Lystra or Iconium, not really sure. And he was preaching there. A woman with an unclean spirit began to prophesy that these guys are men of God, changed not just the right way. I actually, the King James translation of that place makes it look as though she was saying, that these men are men of God, showing us the way of God. But the translation is more like, these are men of the gods, showing us the way of the gods. Are you following? All right. That's their local gods, not yourself, because the revelation of Christ was not in the, the medium. So Paul was vexed in his spirit. Then he cast the spirit out. They pick him up and Silas, and they arrest him. Then they take him to the prison. They prayed, they sang, 
The Bible didn't say the Holy Ghost came down. They prayed and sang, but the Bible says there was an earthquake in the jail cell. Are you following that? Okay, good. Now, they didn't go out. The jailer wanted to kill himself. He said, no, we are all here. Jailer gets saved. Then one of the other guys, the counselors and magistrates that put them in, wake up in the morning and say, oh, yeah, those guys go. Paul said, no. Because you are flogged and imprisoned a Roman citizen. So Paul was versed to an extent in Roman law. He knew what was lawful. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, there are a lot of believers. They love the Lord. They pray. But they are ignorant about things they should be knowledgeable about in their sphere. Ask a question. Tyre, you're an architect, right? Good. Imagine Tyre, filled with the Spirit, loves the Lord. Says he's an architect. But I said, okay, give me a drawing. I want this, I want this, I want this. And he gives me a drawing. It's looking like Pinocchio. Are you following what I'm saying? We don't know what's going on. We are trying to understand. We don't know what's going on. How does that help him in being a productive Christian? You know, I will begin to look. Have you heard people, have you heard people say this? Where they interact with a Christian who is terrible at their job. All right, who comes late, who doesn't get the job done, and they now begin to categorize all Christians. Are, are you following what I'm talking about? So that means, though he's saved, he is not productive with what? The knowledge is barren. Because whether he likes it or not, he cannot produce fruits in that place. Are you following what I'm talking about? So he said, add to your faith gnosis. Add to your faith knowledge. That is regular knowledge. Add it. When we want to discuss with you, don't be empty concerning what you are supposed to know. Glory to God. Yeah. There are some people you will be able to talk to about Christ eventually because of the first thing you started talking about. I mean, people that you were talking about product management or accounting or finance and stuff. Then I was like, one time you now put Christ there. But that, if you do not have the initial conversations, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So you say, out of it, um, knowledge, the, not, to your knowledge, what? Temperance. Temperance, Temperance there's self control. Ah, self control. A lot of brothers and sisters have been ineffective in their knowledge, all right, because of lack of it. He said, add it. Now, you notice self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. But yet, he says, add it, because he's talking about manifesting it for all to see. He's talking about taking what is in you by the indwelling of the spirit and, all right, manifesting it in your soul and your body, in your conduct. After self-control, what's next? And to temperance, patience. Ah, patience. And to temperance, patience. 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 Ah, dear God. Patience. That word. That is a word a lot of faith people don't know. Because we've heard a lot of a lot about now now. Patience. A lot of people do not understand the godly fruit called patience. And by extension, contentment. Patience. It is a, a, a quality of the recreated human spirit. That we must add to our feet. Now, let me explain the word add. You saw, you, you see that word add, right? Yes, add, right? Now, the word add there is the Greek word epikorigos. Guys, let me just let me just let me just say something. 
time is about gone. I just remembered the first time I heard that word, Epicorigos. All right, the teaching on this scripture. The first time I heard it was Pastor Chris or Yakilome. Around 2004, 2005. It, it now reminds me of something. As we are coming to church and hearing the words, it's an investment. Do you understand? It's an investment. You are becoming as you are listening. That's the truth. You may not really pay attention, um, pay attention to how you are developing. You may, you may figure it out years from now. But you are developing, you are growing and all. Because Pastor Christian taught me that that word there is epicorigos. And epicorigos means to sponsor. If you, I mean, if you have watched movies, right? Then you see uh, uh, like uh, executive producer. Now, the executive producer did not act in the movie, right? But what the executive producer did was everything that needed to be available for the movie to hold, he supplied it. So the executive producer is one that furnished all that was necessary for the movie to hold. So that means the goal of the executive producer was what? The movie. Is that correct? Church, talk to me. Is that correct? But all he did was to ensure that the movie, you understand? Now, in Greek arts, the guy who ensured that the drama went on in the Greek theaters and all back then, it was called the what? The Epicorigos. He was his sponsor. He's the one that put the money together, put the artist together to ensure that the event or the art or the drama or whatever festival held. So, Peter borrows that word. And he says, add to your faith virtue. So what is he saying? He's saying, sponsor your faith with these things. The goal is your faith. Amen? That means you are the message. I believe in Jesus. He died. He rose. You understand? So he's saying, yes, you have the faith. You are in the faith. You are saved. Yes. He now said, but add to your faith. Because a sponsor. So that means the sponsors of the message. That will ensure that the message will get fruits. Will bear results in the hearts of men around you. That know you. He says moral, uh, moral excellence, virtue, self-control. All right? Gnosis, knowledge. Then he says self-control. Uh, self-control, yeah? Then he says patience. Are you following? Come on, are you following? So these things, these virtues are the sponsor of your faith. What other word did he tell us about after patience? And to patience, godliness. Godliness. That is Uzebia. All right? That is godlikeness. Acting like God. You understand? Where people do ah, a character is so nice. Ah, that brother, very gentle, very nice. You understand? They say, ah, ah, he doesn't lie, he doesn't steal. All right, you can trust him. If you give him more, um, put money with him, he will not, he will give it back to you. Godliness. So when people talk that this is how you are, all right. By the time you come to talk to them about the word of God, they will listen. Are you following? They will listen. That character is a sponsor for your faith. Praise the Lord. Have you had someone come to preach? <laughs> Let me tell you a story. Story, story. <laughs> there was a lady that attended church one time. She used to come to church. But you know, you know... <laughs> So one day, I was praying for some folks. So she had invited her friend to church. So she, uh, the friend came out that she wanted to be prayed for. So, um, you know, I was training people, you know, how to minister and all. So I took this lady and told her, bring your hand and put your hand on the friend. Do you know the friend, the, what happened to the friend? The friend refused. No, I'm serious. 
This happened at, what's the name of that? King's Plaza. I can never forget it. The friend refused. He said, no. Do you know why she refused? Uh -uh. I know where me and this girl goes to. How can you tell me that she's going to impart me with something? Are you following? Now, is it possible? Could God still have used that friend? Yes. But that other friend closed her heart to her ministry. Are you following? Because of her lifestyle. So, her, her faith, all right, or her knowledge of God, she couldn't be productive with it. Hallelujah. All right, next one. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Philadelphia. Brotherly kindness. All right. Filio adephos. It's two words. Philadelphia is two words. Filio, that friendship love, adephos, among brothers. So that means be demonstrative with your love for brothers. Brothers mean the brotherhood. All right. Those who are saved. Let the unbeliever look at believers and see the love. Don't hide the love in your heart. Are you following what I'm saying? Let them say, ah, those Christians. Ah, the way they are always about each other's business. Now, why? If one person has a problem, they have quickly rallied around, you understand, um, this thing. Ah, another person, they've rallied around. They always help each other. Let that be the thing they say about us. Filio Adelphos. Philadelphia. Brotherly kindness. Brotherly what? Ah, this person, I don't have a place to stay. Oh, yeah, come and stay with me for a few days till you get, find your food. Ah, I don't have food, though. Ah, well, oh, yeah, come and take it. Ah, this is your clothes. Oh, yeah, come and take. I have some. You, it's like you are my size. Oh, yeah, take. When you are doing that, by the time you want to now explain scripture to that same person, it will listen to you. Praise God. There are some people that have shrink away from local churches, from going to church because of the poverty of Philadelphia. Brotherly kindness. It was in sin. When they came to church, it was about, um, oh yeah, we are raising seeds. We are giving for this. We are giving for that. That's all they were hearing. Oh yeah, we are giving for the other side. There was no brotherly kindness. When they sinned or they made a mistake, all they got was judgment. All they got was ridicule. Nobody wanted to help. Brotherly kindness. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Are you seeing this? So that means when you are growing spiritually, you will, we will see more brotherly kindness from me. Is that correct? Is that correct? We will see more self-control from me. Is that correct? Come on, talk to me. Is that correct? Yeah. Right, next one. What's next? And to brotherly kindness, charity. Love. To brotherly kindness, charity. Love. Next verse. For if these things be in you. He said, and if this thing be in you, and what? Abound. So that means you should lavishly supply epigorigos, these virtues, abundantly. Amen. So if these things be in you, and about. Next one. They make you that you, sh you neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus No, Christ. so what he's talking about in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, it means you will produce results with the knowledge. You will have disciples. The disciples will grow. Are you following? You produce ministry fruits. You've invited people to church. Nobody wants to come with you. It may be you are lacking in this thing. Because people always want to go with someone they want to be like. Are you following what I'm saying? They want to be like you, so they follow you. Hey, listen to me. Nobody just follows Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? For you to follow Jesus, somebody talked about that Jesus to you. I, am I lying? Somebody talk to you about Jesus. Because nobody's seen any Jesus anywhere. I, wait, I, I, let me tell you something. Guys, listen. Have you noticed that when a popular preacher falls, even Christians will begin to say stuff. Are, are you follow? Have you not noticed? When you have a scandal, broke out, you now begin to, Christians, oh, 
Why? Why is it that um, 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 a man that did not die for believers is making believers talk anyhow because he failed? Why? It's simple. Because people follow models. They follow men they can see. It's the truth. That is why it is critical. Though we say, put your eyes on Jesus, is Jesus your following? But it's very critical that the men and women in Christ that are preaching Jesus must be careful how they walk. So that they will be productive in their knowledge of Christ and not the barren. Amen. Spiritual growth. Because of our time, let me end by telling you this. Listen to me. Listen to me and listen to me very carefully. You can walk miracles and not be growing spiritually. You can heal the sick and not be growing spiritually. You can give and not be growing spiritually. Then you can grow spiritually and regress spiritually. It is only spiritual growth where you can regress. Physical growth, you cannot regress. Once you have grown for full maturity, all right, you cannot, you understand? If you have grown to five feet, you cannot become four foot. You understand that? But in spiritual growth, growth must be continual. So, in spiritual growth, you have to continually feed. In spiritual growth, you have to continually exercise. In spiritual growth, you have to continually continue. In that which you have been taught and trained to do. <laughs> so there's no sabbatical from the activities of the believer. You can't go and leave. You can't transfer. You remain and you continue. Glory to God. I said glory to God. You remain and you continue. Praise the Lord. So let us recap. You cannot grow without knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Accurate, precise knowledge of the Son of God. How does this knowledge come? By study. All right? With the aid of the Spirit of God, your eyes are open to see and understand Jesus from the written word. And the understanding of Jesus from the written word will cause you to come into the discovery of the riches of his glory that is in you. And the what? Exceeding greatness of his power at work for you. Praise God. All right? That's how you grow in knowledge. Right? But the result of spiritual growth or that growth in knowledge is that it trusts you to magnify or abound in what? Moral, moral virtue, moral character, self-control. Praise God. Knowledge, patience, love, and brotherly kindness. So if you see a believer... Who is not kind to fellow believers, that believer, no matter the Greek and Hebrew coming out of his mouth, is not growing. And based on all we have said, if you are not growing spiritually, you will not be productive in your knowledge concerning who? Concerning Christ. And if you are not productive concerning your knowledge concerning Christ, it will affect the number of people you are able to disciple. Is that correct? Is that correct? Uh, because nobody's going to flock around someone that does not have brotherly kindness. Is that correct? No one is not going to flock around, no one is going to flock around someone that does not have, it's not demonstrating love. All right? No one is going to be demonstrating flocking around someone that doesn't work in self-control. You see that? You see that? Uh-huh. So, spiritual growth is critical because your productivity in the kingdom depends on it. We cannot afford to have too many people stuck in their journey, not growing. We can't afford it because a church full of babies is a daycare center. Hallelujah. A church full of babies is a daycare center where we have milk, milk all over the place. Nobody can be given responsibility. Imagine a church full of babies where the pastor also is a baby. There's going to be a lot of fights. There's going to be a lot of crying. They look me above diaper changing and diaper rash. Everybody will be fighting about things that don't matter because they are all babies. Like the Corinthian church. Hallelujah. Like the Corinthian church. So, spiritual gift manifestation does not 
confer on you spiritual growth. You can walk in spiritual gifts and not be growing. Hallelujah. You can speak in tongues and not be growing. In fact, you can speak in tongues and they say the heavenly tongues are not growing. Growth is in knowledge. Growth is in character. Hallelujah. All right, but the character stems from the knowledge. Are you learning something today? All right. Can we just lift up our hands and just bless his name? Uh, and just begin to talk to the Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. Kila pasida haradida. Rama telebayele bosatahaya. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to grow. Help me to grow. Help me to grow. Help me to grow. Lete sepatia. Mande karabashata kabahaya. Lika superadi sepadia. Help me to grow. Zita lekora master. Let on tokoboro city. Leta maye. Help me to grow. Because you see, the kingdom is dependent on that. You're Thank you for listening. We are sure that you have been blessed. For more messages, kindly search for our Telegram channel using the link t.me slash oikia cc. God has blessed you.